Book of Mormon Prophecy, a podcast series by Avraham Gileadi, Ph.D. 25. The Mission of God's Servant Why is God's end-time servant hidden until the time of Jesus' second coming to reign on the earth? Was that a reason Nephi was forbidden to say anything about it? Welcome to podcast number 25, The Mission of God's Servant. The Lord's servant has been hid from the foundation of the world because he's going to be a test to the saints and to everybody else in the world. Uh, the same as Jesus' coming was a test for the Jews and for those of that world. So, but we have a number of scriptures from Isaiah and also other scriptures which you don't have time to mention that talk about the Lord's servant and describe him in some detail so we can get to know a little bit about him that way. And then we'll end up with a scripture from 3 Nephi where Jesus talks about his servant specifically. Even though he's hidden and Nephi quotes Isaiah when he can't say more about what he saw in his vision, what he saw in his own vision of the end from the beginning, he quotes Isaiah to say what he can't say and what he couldn't say was the description of the mission of the Lord's end time servant. The scriptures that he starts quoting from are Isaiah 48 and 49 that talk about that servant. So he's trying to tell us indirectly what he saw uh, that way. We're going to start off with Isaiah 42, 1 through 4. Jehovah speaks of his end time servant. It says, my servant whom I sustain. Of course, Jehovah is not his own servant. And Jehovah is Jesus, or Jesus is Jehovah the Old Testament, and he's not a servant. He's never called his servant actually anywhere in the Scriptures. Only Paul says that he took upon himself the likeness of a servant, but he's not a similitude of a servant. But Jesus is never called a servant. And we also know that Isaiah's is an end-time scenario, not even the time of the prophet Joseph Smith. So this is part of an end-time scenario that's going to happen when the Lord speaks this way. My servant whom I sustain, so the Lord is behind him, even though he'll have enemies, many enemies, they will not be able to counteract what the Lord does because the Lord himself sustains him and calls him. And anyway, why would we oppose a servant of the Lord if the Lord calls him? And some say, well, why would he call a servant and the rest of it? Most people really don't know the scriptures that say those things. Because everything that happens in the end time follows the patterns of the past and in the past, the Lord used servants, of course, to do his work for him. And they had opposition too, and they nevertheless succeeded in their roles, and the Lord sustained them. My servant whom I sustain, my chosen one in whom I delight. So he's a very specific and unique individual. As a literal person, him have I endowed with my spirit. He will dispense justice to the Gentiles or the nations. So he comes along the scene by implication at a time where there is no justice or little justice. As it says elsewhere in Isaiah, the Lord saw that there was no justice and it displeased him. So he comes along at a time to restore justice, to dispense justice to the Gentiles at a time of injustices. He will not shout or raise his voice to make himself heard in public. So he's not standing on the street corner and so forth. He has a quiet voice, but he is deliberate and does what the Lord wants him to do. Even a bruised reed he will not break, or a dim wick he will not snuff out. So he does not walk over people. He has care for even the weak among us and those who really need help. A bruised reed, those who have been bruised or pressed. A dim wick, those who are barely burning, their light is barely on, ready to snuff out. But he's not going to do that. He's going to help heal them. He will perform the work of justice in the cause of truth. And, of course, justice is based on truth, but injustice is based on untruth or lack of truth. But he's going to restore justice not only to God's people, but to the earth. Neither shall he himself grow dim or be bruised until he has brought about justice in the earth. And that was what Moses did. He brought justice among God's own people who were in captive to the uh, Egyptians. It said of Moses, even at the end of a, a long life, his visage did not get dim, 
he didn't lose his strength or energy? Well, because he was translated. This is a subtle idea thrown in here that he's also going to be translated like as Moses was. And finally, it says the, the isles await his law, because he is a lawgiver as Moses was a lawgiver. And the law is, of course, the doctrine of Christ, and especially what's called in the scriptures the fine points of Christ's doctrine that Jesus mentions and that we don't apparently have today. Or if we do, we've perverted them and, or misread them or misinterpreted them. So the isles await his law. And who are on the isles? His mission is universal, but specifically the isles, namely the Americas, the land of promise of America. Let me go on reading in the same chapter, Isaiah 42, verses 6 and 7. Jehovah creates and appoints his servant. If you follow the word create all the way through the book of Isaiah, you see that whatever the Lord does, it's a recreation. All creation is a recreation, but the Hebrew doesn't have that word, so he just says create. But we understand it to be a recreation. The creation of Adam and Eve was a recreation. Everything that happens in the last days is a recreation. The earth is recreated to a higher spiritual level and a higher physical level. There are seven different spiritual levels in the book of Isaiah, and the higher levels, when a person ascends from one to the other, in each instance throughout the book of Isaiah, the Lord says of them that he creates them, meaning he recreates them on a higher level. They are reborn spiritually and physically on a higher spiritual level. Okay, so we read, I, Jehovah, have rightfully called you, or have called you in righteousness, or have called you by the name righteousness. And else we read of the servant that his name is righteousness. He personifies righteousness. So the Lord calls him, and I will grasp you by the hand. And the grasping by the hand is what an emperor did to his vassal kings when he gave him a new name, and when he gave him a new commission, and when he adopted him as his son, a literal son by adoption. And he was treated as son, a familial son at that point. So this is what's going on. If Jehovah is the emperor and the servant is his vassal, according to the terms of the Davidic covenant, they have that relationship, then the Lord is going to grasp him personally by the hand and calls him to his job. And it says, I have created you and appointed you to be a covenant for the people, a light to the Gentiles or the nations. So there, he recreates him. I have created you and appointed you. He recreates him to a higher spiritual level. And this happens when he's translated. After he's gone through his descent phase of being tested every which way, whether he keeps the Lord's commandments that the Lord gives him for him personally, then we find out that, you know, everybody who passes that test, those tests of loyalty to the Lord, doing as he commands them on any spiritual level at all, then he recreates them on a higher spiritual level. And then they have a new set of commandments on a higher level to keep and go through a descent phase. And then they experience this ascent phase of recreation. I have created you or recreated you and appointed you. The word appoint is a word link that links all the servant passages in the book of Isaiah. So you can tell that this appointment is of God. It's the same with each of the servant passages or a lot of the servant passages that show that is a divine appointment. In this case, it's to be a covenant for the people a covenant for the people. He is a covenant. So he personifies God's covenant to his people. Kind of like Moses, he was a lawgiver and the law of the Sinai covenant. He was the mediator of God's covenant with his people. That is what's implied here, that he's a mediator of God's covenant by himself being a covenant. And so in other words, if people want to covenant with the Lord in that day and become his people and so forth, they have to go through the servant himself. He is there, as it were, there, the one who ushers them in to God's covenant, who accepts them in through the covenant. She means a lot of things because if he's a lawgiver, he also is in charge of the ordinances of the gospel and so forth. And it says, a light to the Gentiles. So he also personifies God's light. Now, of course, light is an interesting thing because we have the light of Christ and we have the light of the Holy Spirit that enlightens us. And there's a process with regard to light where we receive light from God and then we act on the light, we assimilate it, act on it, and then we begin to reflect God's light to others. It shines from us because we're reflecting the light back 
to him and to others, and they notice that we've changed from just receiving light to also reflecting light because we're ministering to others and we're teaching them the gospel and so forth. That's reflecting God's light. But eventually, when we continue on that process, we, like Christ, who is the light and life of the world, also become lights. And that is what happened here. The servant has reached that point. The Lord calls him to be a light to the Gentiles. So he personifies the Lord's light to them. He's a light giver. To open eyes that are blind, that is, blind spiritually as well as physically, to free captives from confinement, well, from the bands of their iniquities, but also physically to free captives from physical confinement in prisons and so forth. And from prison, those it says here, to those who sit in darkness, spiritually in the dark, but also physically in the dark. This happens to those to whom he ministers, the servant ministers to those, first of all, to the Gentiles, which are us Ephraimites who've come through the Gentile lineages, and secondly, to the house of Israel, because the house of Israel it will in that day, in the end time, need to be delivered from physical bondage as well as spiritual bondage. Next we go to Isaiah 48, which is one of the chapters that Nephi quotes in 1 Nephi 20. 48 verses 14 to 15, Jehovah prospers his servant. It says, All of you assemble and hear, the Lord speaking. Who among you foretold these things? Questioning any of the God's people today, which is Latter day Saints. Who foretold all these things, right? Who among you foretold all these things? Uh, sorry, nobody. It is him Jehovah loves who shall perform his will in Babylon. And this is one of the things, one of the attributes of the servant, because the servant foretells things. He's going to come and foretell things that are fulfilled and happen, and we know that he's a true prophet. It says, It is him that Jehovah loves. So there's He's like John the Beloved, the beloved disciple of Jesus, or the three disciples of Jesus, the three Nephites, or Abraham, my beloved. So there are a number of those in the scriptures that reach that high spiritual level, like Abraham and, and John the Beloved, and uh, in this case, the servant, who are called beloved of the Lord. It's a special term of those who would often reach this translated state. Who shall perform his will in Babylon. So this person whom the Lord loves who is this prophet, the one who foretells things and they come to pass, he's going to perform the Lord's will in Babylon. His arm shall be against the Chaldeans. So the arm is him. He's the arm of righteousness that Isaiah speaks of. And the Lord is going to intervene in the affairs of his people throughout the world, which is Babylon, uh, through this arm of his. And he's going to empower his arm against the Babylonians or Chaldeans. And then the Lord says, I myself have spoken it, and also called him. I have brought him, and I will prosper his way. So here, we get the idea that it's the Lord himself doing this. He has spoken it. Calling him, bringing him, prospering him. When there are enemies, and they say, oh no, that's not of God, and so forth. He's not of God. This is not what we're used to. This is all different now, and the Lord's not going to do anything new that we don't know about, and so forth. He's not going to spring a surprise on us. We've heard everything we need to know and so forth. All the arguments that they use, no, the Lord says, I have spoken it, called him, brought him, I will prosper his way. The next we read in Isaiah 50, verses 7 through 9, which is quoted in 2 Nephi 7 by Jacob. Jehovah's servant meets opposition. Well, of course, which servant of God does not meet opposition, right? Especially uh, the more we progress spiritually, the more Satan finds ways to oppose us. We know that. That's the pattern always, but it's a test to us, and it's a test for the servant, of course. We're all growing spiritually, and he is too. Because my Lord Jehovah helps me, now the servant is speaking, helps me against what? Well, against this opposition, right? Against from people you'd not expect, maybe insiders. Because my Lord Jehovah helps me, I shall not be disgraced. Well, disgraced by whom? I have set my face like flint, knowing I shall not be confounded. In other words, the opposition gets pretty severe, so he has to really knuckle down and set his face like flint. He who vindicates me is near, and that's Jehovah vindicates him. Who has a dispute with me? Let us face one another. Why? Because you're going behind my back and you're talking with one another. Why don't you just face me? Talk to me straight. Who will bring charges against me? Let him confront me with them. 
right? They're doing their machinations against him, and and he says, "No, come on, let's let's have it out." See, my Lord Jehovah sustains me. Who then will incriminate me? His own people, of course, incriminated Jesus. His own people incriminated Joseph Smith, and his own people are going to incriminate God's servant, or try to. And he says, surely all such shall wear out like a garment. The moth shall consume them. The idea of an old garment, of course, is the old order is passing away and things are going to become anew. We're going to have a new garment. And the moth will consume them, just like they make holes in garments, old garments. That's the old order. It's full of holes. It's also a covenant curse. Next, we move on to Isaiah 49, verses 1 through 3 which Nephi quotes in 1 Nephi 21. Jehovah's servant is hidden. And now this is the servant speaking to us directly. And this is what he says. Hear me, O isles. Listen to me, you distant peoples. Well, listen, you distant peoples. So it's a worldwide mission that he has from the get-go. But particularly, first of all, to the Gentiles, God's own covenant people today, which is us Latter-day Saints. By definition, in the Scriptures, all through the Scriptures, especially Book of Mormon and Doctrine and Covenants, Jehovah called me before I was in the belly. Before I was in my mother's womb, he mentioned me my name. Well, of course, spiritually and physically. And we know that these callings are from before the foundation of the world that we are fulfilling in the end time today, or will be fulfilling. That kind of goes along with that idea, but it was a foreordained calling. He has made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand he hid me. He made me into a polished arrow. In his quiver he kept me secret. Right, so we have several metaphors here. His mouth is like a sharp sword. And we read in Isaiah 11 that indeed if, if somebody confronts him and he says something to condemn that person, that person better look out because he can slay people with the sound of his voice. And in the shadow of his hand he hid me. So he's been hidden from the world under this metaphor of the Lord's hand. That's how it appears in the book of Isaiah. He's the right hand of the Lord in the book of Isaiah, and the Lord has a left hand. The king of Assyria is the Lord's left hand of punishment in God's day of judgment in the end time. But the Lord's right hand, the servant, is hand of deliverance in the end time. He delivers God's people from the powers of evil, from the king of Assyria and all those who are seeking to destroy them. But he also is a sharp sword to redefine what the scriptures are saying and to bring God's truth to his people in the end time. He's made him into a polished arrow. And of course, that's a little ominous because the arrows pierce people, right? They pierce the wicked, especially. In his quiver, he kept me secret. So he's been secret all this time until he appears on the scene, basically, just like Jesus. And the Jews never expected someone like Jesus to come along. Because their idea of a Messiah was like the Latter-day David, which is this person whom we're talking about, this end-time servant, who would deliver them from their enemies, physical enemies, rather than save them spiritually as Jesus did. And this time around, it's the opposite. As Brigham Young said, the Jews were mistaken about Jesus' first coming, so the Gentiles will be mistaken about his second coming. Because in that day, the Jews were believing and hoping for this Latter-day David, and in our day, we're hoping and praying for the second coming of Jesus, never expecting the servant. Of course, somebody has to prepare the way before him, right? John the Baptist did anciently. And as Enoch established a covenant people, and then the Lord came to them, so there was an end time need for establishing Zion, one who prepares the way. And that is this end time servant. And you see why he would get opposition, because he just kind of disrupts the old order and everything becomes new at the time that he comes along. And Isaiah says that. It says, new things are yet declaring to you, right? We've covered that in our previous podcasts. He said to me, you are my servant, Israel, in whom I will be glorified. Israel? We thought his name was David, and that's what the prophet Joseph Smith also says. The Lord will raise up one by the name of David, raised out, out of David's lineage in the last days. Well, yes, his name is David, but why would he call him Israel here in Isaiah? Well, because... It indicates that he receives a new name, just as Jacob anciently was called Jacob, and then the Lord gave him a new name, that is Israel, ruling with God, is the meaning of the name. 
So he rules with God too. He's given a new name and a new commission at the time he ascends to a higher spiritual level, at the time that he's commissioned and empowered of God to perform his end time mission. And so it also indicates that he's a proxy for the house of Israel. By being named Israel, he also personifies Israel, as it were. He's a surrogate for Israel with God, and he pleads the cause of Israel, and he intercedes with God for of the house of Israel. Next we go to Isaiah 49, 5 and 6. Let's continue on a little bit. Also quoted in 1 Nephi 21. The servant restores Israel. And that's his job, his end time job, the house of Israel. The natural lineage of the house of Israel, the Jews, the ten tribes and Lamanites of today, and any other natural lineages that we don't know about. For now Jehovah has said, He who formed me from the womb to be his servant to restore Jacob to him. Jacob, because that's the name that the natural lineages of Israel are still under in their lost and fallen state. It indicates the lost and fallen state of those who need to be re restored to God's covenant and come into his covenant again, which is their birthright, their heritage. And then it says, Israel having been gathered to him. Well, Israel, meaning those who have been gathered today, which are Ephraim, which is another name for Israel. We're called Israel because we are part of the covenant now. We're not in a lost and fallen state, or should not. And we have gathered. For I won honor in the eyes of Jehovah when my God became my strength. Well, he became his strength after a long and severe and painful descent phase, because we know that he suffers greatly, as we'll see in a moment. That is God strengthened him. That is Jehovah strengthened him and empowered him over all nations, in fact, and over the elements even, at a certain time when he passed every test. And he said, it's too small a thing for you to be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob, to restore the tribes of Jacob, all 12 tribes, not just Ephraim, and to restore those preserved of Israel. I will also appoint you to be a light to the nations that my salvation may be to the end of the earth. There is the word appoint again that we saw in connection with the servant in Isaiah 42. And he's also, again, spoken of as a light to the Gentiles or a light to the nations. And that my salvation may be to the end of the earth because he's a foreigner of salvation. He prepares the way among God's end time people, both his people of the Gentiles, the Ephraimites, and also those of the house of Israel, the natural lineages, for the coming of the Lord. And the Lord Jehovah, of course, personifies salvation in the book of Isaiah. And even Jesus, the name Jesus, is the same name, salvation. So he's a forerunner of salvation. And he must establish righteousness first, of which he is an exemplar, so that salvation may come. Next we go to Isaiah 49, 8 and 10, quoted in 1 Nephi 21. A servant is appointed. So we're beginning to see some of the same terminology that Isaiah used in chapter 42, that we just read a little while ago in chapter 49, which is like a double witness. Because here it says, I have created you and appointed you to be a covenant of the people. And we saw that before in Isaiah 42. He's recreated on a higher spiritual level, and he's appointed of the Lord personally to be a covenant for the people or the mediator of the covenant and so forth. He personifies God's covenant. And then he gets a new commission, and that's what it says next, to restore the land and reapportion the desolate estates. He's to raise up the tribes of Jacob, restore those preserved of Israel, or the remnant of Israel, remnant of Ephraim, to restore the land and reapportion the desolate estates. He's going to endow God's people with permanent lands of inheritance that they will inherit throughout the millennial age. And this is to say to the captives, come forth and to those in darkness, show yourselves, indicating that those who are taken captive by oppressors and tyrants and dictators and so forth, in the end time, he's going to release them from them, namely the house of Israel nations, to those in darkness, spiritual darkness, physical darkness, show yourselves. So he's going to be like Moses who releases the captives in Egypt and brings them in a new exodus to lands of promise. And he's also like Joshua, who was the one who reapportioned the desolate estates of the Canaanites among the tribes of Israel. And then it talks about a new exodus, new exodus imagery. They shall feed along the way and find pasture on all barren heights. They shall not hunger or thirst, nor be smitten by the heat wave or the sun. He who has mercy on them will guide them. He will lead them by springs of water. So this is part of Exodus imagery as the Israelites wandered in the wilderness and they did not suffer hunger. The Lord provided for them the quail and the manna and the waters 
from the springs and fountains and so forth that the Lord does again. The Lord provides for these people who are homecoming to, to Zion, to lands of promise, during their long, or however short or long, wilderness wandering. Next we go to Isaiah 51, 9 through 11, quoted in 2 Nephi 8. Jehovah empowers his arm. Awake, arise, clothe yourself with power, O arm of Jehovah, bestir yourself as in ancient times, as in generations of old. So he's the arm of Jehovah, and he has to wake up. That is, wake from his descent phase and be reborn spiritually, and now receives his ascent phase where he's, he's empowered of God. First he had no power, and his enemies had power over him. Now the reverse happens. And he's recreated or regenerated, actually translated. O arm of Jehovah, bestir yourself, as in ancient times, as in generations of old. He's the arm of God. Wasn't that you who carved up Rahab, you who slew the dragon? Now, Rahab was Egypt, and the dragon was its pharaoh, anciently. Anciently, he was that angel who led Israel in the cloudy pillar to the promised land through the wilderness. Was it not you who dried up the sea, that was the Red Sea anciently, the waters of the mighty deep, and made of ocean depths a way by which the redeemed might pass? So, but this ancient Exodus is a type of the end time Exodus, as we saw, and God empowers him. God's end time people of the house of Israel come in a new Exodus to Zion, to millennial lands of inheritance. Then we go to Isaiah 51 9 through 11, continuing. Jehovah empowers his arm. It gives us this Exodus imagery of the new Exodus. Let the ransom of Jehovah return. Let them come singing to Zion, their heads crowned with everlasting joy. Let them obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and sighing flee away. Of course, they receive or have a reversal of their circumstances, from curse to blessing, from sorrow and sighing that have prevailed during the hard times of the end time. And now everything is reversed. They are received joy and gladness forever. No more sorrow after that. No more remembering this time period even. And last of all, we go to Isaiah 52. Isaiah 52, verses 13 through 15, which Jesus quotes in 3 Nephi 20 and 21. Jehovah's servant is marred or disfigured. He says, My servant, Jehovah speaking, being astute, shall be highly exalted and shall become exceedingly eminent. This is like Solomon, whose fame went worldwide in the ancient world, but not until he goes through his descent phase, right? Which is what it says next. Just as he appalled many, his appearance was marred or disfigured beyond human likeness, his semblance unlike that of men. So you could hardly recognize him as human after his enemies get through disfiguring him. So that is the price that he pays, that is the acceptable sacrifice that he offers up to the Lord that then sets this whole work of the restoration of the house of Israel in motion. So shall he yet astound many nations, kings shutting their mouths at him, what was not told them they shall see. What they had not heard, they shall consider. So these are the spiritual kings and queens of the Gentiles that Isaiah talks about, that Nephi and Jacob and Jesus quote. They talk about them because they are the ones, in other words, namely us, Latter-day Saints. We've covered that in previous uh, podcasts. When we help restore them, the Jews, the ten lost tribes, and all the natural lineages of the house of Israel. The last of all, we finish up here with 3 Nephi 21 quoting that, basically, where Jesus is speaking, verses 10 through 11, Jesus heals his servant who is marred. Quoting Isaiah 52, 13 through 14, and Isaiah 57, 18 and 19, where Jesus heals his servant. Now, this is an end-time scenario. It's not the time of Joseph Smith, and Jesus is not his own servant. You can see it all here. Behold, the life of my servant shall be in my hand. Therefore, they shall not hurt him, although he shall be marred because of them. Yet I will heal him. That's from Isaiah 57, the healing part. For I will show unto them that my wisdom is greater than the cunning of the devil. Therefore it shall come to pass that whosoever will not believe in my words from Jesus Christ, which the Father shall cause him to bring forth unto the Gentiles, and shall give unto him power that he shall bring them forth unto the Gentiles, it shall be done even as Moses said, they shall be cut off from among my people who are of the covenant. And my people of the covenant are us Gentiles today. Those who will not believe the words that the servant brings forth will be cut off from among us from the church, basically, today. And, of course, the words of Jesus that we're speaking about, that he's speaking about, are on the large plates of Nephi. In 3 Nephi 26, they're spoken of. 
where Jesus covered from the beginning of the creation to the time of his coming when the earth should be wrapped up as a scroll and so forth. And that in great detail and, and things that, you know, Mormon could not share with us because we still do not yet believe really what the Book of Mormon is telling us, including the parts of Isaiah. That's basically it. So the servant is a key end time figure. And we also know that the king of Assyria, or the great Antichrist of the last days, is also a key figure of the end time. And we're going to see how all of these scenes play out before very long, I reckon. In summary, by quoting Isaiah about God's end time servant, Book of Mormon prophets could tell indirectly what they saw in vision. They could tell us indirectly, right? Not so constrained by that. Jesus spoke of his servant directly, as he did here in 3 Nephi 21. The time frame is the time immediately preceding Jesus' second coming, when these kings and queens of the Gentiles perform their end time role of restoring the house of Israel. And it's this mission of the servant and the kings, kings and queens of the Gentiles is an end time mission to help them establish Zion, the Zion to which the Lord can then come. And moving forward, are we ready to receive the Lord's servant who prays the way? In other words, we have to be having some faith in it, as Jesus could only come when some Jews, at least, were exercising faith that he was going to come. Then he could come. Moroni says nothing happens until his people exercise faith, at least some of us. Next time, which other end-time servants does God call to prepare the way? Those who assist the one servant. He can't do it all alone. Recommended reading or listening, Isaiah decoded ascending the ladder to heaven. And it's on audio too, as well as the book today. Thank you for joining us today. So appreciate you listening. Hope you got something out of this and continue with us. Please share with others. Thank you. See you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining us today. Join us next time when we learn 26. Who are the end time servants? Are Zenus's servants who graft in the natural branches? John's 144,000 servants? And Isaiah's servants who restore the house of Israel? All the same servants?